The Carpathian mountain range spans 209,000 square kilometers in a great arc across Central and Eastern Europe. Cradled beneath its jagged peaks and hidden among trackless miles of forest is perhaps the world's only surviving medieval landscape. Formed at the same time as the Alps, much of this great range straddles the area of modern-day Romania known as Transylvania. It's a place of myth and legend, a land where the distant howl of the wolf still chills the night air where bears sharpen their claws on towering pines and lynx prowl ghost-like among the sullen crags. Carpathia is truly vast. Almost the same size as Britain, it constitutes the largest tract of unfragmented forest left in Central Europe and is home to the world's greatest concentration of brown bears and 45% of Europe's big carnivores. Their presence helps to preserve one of our most abundant ecosystems. I'll be travelling to the very heart of this breathtaking region in an attempt to uncover the history, the culture and the wildlife of what is Europe's last untamed wilderness. My journey will take me through the foothills, where ancient villages survive practically unchanged despite Romania's stampede towards modernisation. I'll be exploring the forests and mountains beyond as we go in search of the European brown bear and find out why this elusive species is so vital to the survival of the environment. On my way, I'll be meeting a dedicated group of individuals whose passion for this area is helping to redefine its importance as one of the great surviving wonders of the natural world. These include a Transylvanian count who is working to conserve some of the most ancient of Carpathia's medieval villages and His Royal Highness Prince Charles, who can trace his ancestry back to Romania's dark and distant past. The genealogy shows that I'm descended from Vlad the Impala, you see. So I do have a bit of a stake in the country. As it were. With its deep gorges, cliffs and windswept bluffs, Carpathia is a popular destination for lovers of adventure sports. People come here from all over the world to rock climb, kayak and get back to nature. But for many Romanians whose parents were herded into cities by the communist regime, the mountains offer something far deeper, a chance to reconnect with their rural heritage. To get a feel for the geography of this unique mountain range, I joined Mihai Constantinescu, leader of the local Alpine Association. His wife Mihaila and their friend Nicoletta Carpignano for a two-day trek through the Apicen region. Yeah, finally. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, these uh, roads are a bit labyrinthine. Yeah, sure. Must get used with this. Hi, Nicoletta. Nicoletta, Charlie. Hi. So, where exactly are we going? They will uh, going to have um, around 15 kilometers. Yeah. We'll set the tent tonight, and tomorrow we'll do the rest of the trip, and finally we'll reach the daffodil fields. That is very spectacular, and we have to be there because now they are fully At bloomed. The very best. Yes. You see, that's the traditional way of harvesting the, the woods. Yeah. They are using horses for that to carry the woods. Yes. And this will be this is wood, uh, for the firewood. Yes, yes, for yes for exactly. Yeah. Will be used for fire. As you head up into the hills, the terrain rapidly grows wilder, and the forest closes in around you. This is a world so ancient and unspoilt that our presence feels as ephemeral as the footprints we leave behind us. All my life, I've dreamt about visiting the Transylvanian wilds, but where Bram Stoker describes a sinister and haunted landscape, instead you find yourself in a world more redolent of Tolkien. Uh, this is actually the longest cave in Trasco Mountains. It has uh, more than two kilometers of uh, caves and galleries. So this great chasm is a system that goes right back through the mountain? Yes, it's going through the mountain. You can actually go and get out on the other side. It's, you can see the place where the water goes in and it pops up here. This tributary, though, is part of the Ariash River system? Yes, exactly. And the gorge that we're about to walk to yeah. is the next door valley, I presume? Yes, it's a parallel valley to this. It's like several hours of walking. Well, lead on. OK.
We approached our campsite as dusk was fading to black. A fire was already lit and a local troupe of travelling minstrels were practising for next week's Big Daffodil Festival at nearby Negriliasa. This is a traditional pursuit for Romanians at weekends in this area. They come camping. It's one of the big things you do here. That's right. I think we're very lucky. We've got such beautiful countryside here, and most people appreciate that, so they come here weekends, also summer holidays. They usually get a tent and their backpacks, and they go in the middle of the mountain. So you have to carry everything with you. Including your musical instruments. Festivities continued late, a single small island of light and warmth in a vast ocean of night, the only other illumination being a pale, ociferous moon. Check the coast is clear for bears. Oh. Morning in the mountains. I haven't seen it yet. This is my first view of it properly because we arrived in the middle of the night. It's paradise. These high alpine meadows, the smell of the juniper bushes, the light, just can't beat it. After a long morning's walk, we reached the wild daffodil pastures of the Apusan Hills. And although the festival was due to be held the following week, the ground was already a carpet of white. Well, I'm so glad we've finally made it. It's taken uh, us, yes. what, two days, 50k thereabouts. And here we are finally. Yeah, nice place to come to. What an amazing place to yes. come to. It's truly wonderful. Thank you so much. For my pleasure, being anytime. My guide. I think we should sit down and just take it all in. Enjoy the view. These stunning meadows of daffodils are just one of Carpathia's many floral spectacles, as I discovered when I caught up with Head of World Wildlife Romania, Erika Stansiu, at a local food and crafts festival in Nukshwara. Erica, hi. Yes, hi. 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 Thank you. Nice to see you. What a wonderful spectacle. <laughs> is this a regular occasion? Well, it's becoming regular. It is an old tradition that stopped during the communist times, and now it is being renewed. And the local people, including children, are very, very happy to do this Absolutely. and very proud. And these are all the local crafts, are they? Yes, these are all local people coming together to have fun and do some work as well. So this is a traditional social event, if you like. A social it's a club. social club. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Why are the Carpathians so important, so unique? Well, because we still have large areas of wilderness, which means um, very well balanced ecosystems with uh, the entire, the whole array of um, habitats and species that are naturally, were naturally here and still naturally are here with the, na with the natural processes still happening. Because this, this is really unchanged from the way it was a thousand years ago. Yes, there are large areas, large core areas I would call them, which are still in their natural uh, form. These large wilderness areas are linked with corridors, and this means that um, animals have space to move. And they can move. move freely. They can move freely. W why is that so important? It's vital, it is vital, especially for some of the species, like the large carnivores, that need large spaces to otherwise, survive. Presumably you get inbreeding. Otherwise there will be inbreeding, otherwise the whole population will be disappearing, if you like, right. because uh, they need space to live. Uh, these are large animals that uh, need large areas to feed on, and uh, it's crucial for them to have these corridors between the wilderness areas. You have a lot of cuckoos around here. Yes, and uh, many other species of birds. We have um, many, many wonderful species of flora, um, 
fields of daffodil, of wild daffodils and uh, wild uh, orchids and many, many other species uh, which are very different from one season to the other. In uh, May now and in June, up in the Alp alpine areas, you can see wonderful gardens of wildflowers. Inhospitable though the Carpathians often are, people have been living here for millennia and the mountains around Gradestia de Monte conceal something extraordinary. What you see today is estimated to be less than 10% of an ancient city that lies tangled and buried beneath the roots of the forest. The ruins of Sami Sejatusa, capital of the Dacians, have been described as the Machu Picchu of Europe, although they predate the Incas by nearly a thousand years. Around 200 AD, it was the cultural, religious and military heart of a civilization that stretched from Slovakia all the way to the Black Sea. But this is an area that's proved almost impossible to conquer for any length of time. The Romans were forced to pull out due to the high cost of policing such wild terrain. Then came the Huns, the Avars, the Slavs and the Bulgars, the Magyars and most enduring of all, the Saxons. Travelling northeast towards Brashov and the foothills, you reach a region where the German language is still widely spoken and many of the people are descended from immigrants who came here in the 12th century. Or at least that was the case up until the early 1990s. This is an all too common sight these days. Empty houses, derelict village halls, crumbling churches. And while the younger generations spurn the peasant lifestyle for the draw of the big city, a far larger problem faces areas like this one. Following the revolution and the fall of Ceausescu, the German government gave its Saxon cousins the opportunity to return to their homeland. Faced with the choice between continued hardship, poverty and political instability, or the chance of a new life in the West, many families literally up sticks, leaving everything behind them. Fortunately, not all of these depleted settlements have been abandoned. Aside from a growing Romani population who have moved in to take advantage of the free housing, there is still a stalwart Saxon contingent who have stayed on and are attempting to inject new life into what is a vital part of Romania's cultural identity. The village of Viscri is one of the lucky ones, where members of the community have banded together to preserve their architecture and traditions. Many of these houses date to the time of the first settlers, direct forebears of today's inhabitants, like local resident Caroline Fernaland. My ancestors came 1142, invited by King Geza II of Hungary to defend this area against the invasions. So they came with a golden letter, we call it. And this is why they built 240 villages in Transylvania, and every village has a fortified church. All the time somebody was watching from the tower to see if it is dangerous and then they would ring immediately the bells and everybody piles into the church. Very quick. Locks very the door quick. behind them. Yeah. Of course. This is Alba Iglesia. In 1400 it was first mentioned and from this is coming the name of the village. Deutsch Weisskirch, Saas Ferechhaso and Viskri in Romanian. Right. White church in German. White church in German. Marvellous door. <laughs> it is a very simple church and our daughter, she finds some rules from 1640, how the community was organised and what they have, what have been allowed to do and what not. For example, if somebody during the service was snoring and your second neighbour would hear you, you have to pay a fine. So it's okay if you fall asleep, but you must do so very quietly. Very quietly, yes. And presumably there was a pecking order in terms of where people sat in the church. Yes, this we are respecting also today, even if we are eight, nine people. For example, the, the young ladies, they sit in the back, and when you get older, you move more in, in the front. After, after 80, Gerard, you have to sit here close to the angel of death. This is the last station alive. It is preparing you... For the afterlife. For the afterlife. How extraordinary. That shows a very healthy 
business-like attitude to mortality, really. Look at this. It is unbelievable. It's just so big, you can see, I mean, all the tiles, all the beams, all the way up the structure inside the tower. I mean, I felt like I was gazing down Noah's Ark, it's, you know, as you saw the, the roof of the church. The amount of work that must be required to maintain a building like this. Community has done this when it was needed. This is why they have not built something new here. They only maintained the, the church and the towers how they have been always. Ceausescu, in 88, he proposed that 8,000 villages like this to be destroyed in Romania, to destroy our identity. This was his goal. And now Viscri and other villages are listed, recognized by World Heritage, UNESCO. It's so lucky he was deposed in the nick of time, <laughs> I think. When I'm here, I feel that I'm the richest person from this world. And if you are here in the evenings and hear these birds and insects singing, I really think it is wonderful and all stress from the day is gone. Disappears. <laughs> it's disappears. Yes, I think gazing out from this balcony has to be qualified as a form of meditation, really. It is, uh, and I'm very grateful that I I'm allowed to live here and now in this democracy. While the 21st century is starting to make its presence felt here, for the Saxon contingent, daily life is still remarkably unchanged. With the influx of tourism and the opening of several guest houses, embracing both the traditional and the more modern, greater effort is being made to preserve the old ways. Everyone in the community has their role, whether it's the daily grind of making flour and baking bread for the village in stone ovens, or looking after the livestock. When you live this close to the Carpathians, one of the more full-time jobs is tending the sheep. Accompanied by their packs of ferocious Heinz 57 guard dogs, these shepherds have to spend nights sleeping out on the hills to protect their flocks from the constant threat of large carnivores. They had, they had problems, yeah, usually the, the wolves are attacking. Lupul te atacă, te pândește. Șade drept o grămadă cu mărăcini undeva, vine, te vede că ai trecut încolo și s-a sărit pe oai. Does he ever get scared? Because presumably if he catches a wolf attacking a sheep, he's got to go out there and try and bash it over the head with his shepherd's crook. Nu mi-e teamă, dar el e, e fioros. În momentul când... De, <coughs> în momentul dacă l-a pus de el viestul înainte, Și nu te vede el, e bine. Dacă te vede el și l-ai văzut tu, răgușești. Nu mai poți răi, gata. Would he rather there were no wolves, or is one or two sheep a year an acceptable loss to have large carnivals living in Romania? Deci să nu ai pierdere, paguba. Dar să fie urși lupi. Poți să fie urși lupi, dar să nu ai paguba. Every day, Stelica and his colleagues drive their flock for miles across the open pasture. And most exhausting of all, as I found out, they also need to milk each sheep by hand, twice. It's official, I'm milking sheep. <laughs> it's not as easy as it looks. That one's empty, though. We're done. Let's try this. Very nice, sweet. Alas, this way of doing things could soon be outlawed, as dairies and local cheesemakers are shut down because they can't afford to comply with the bewildering battalion of EU health regulations. One organisation that is striving to prevent this from happening is ADEPT, a charity that maintains local methods of farming and living off the land are essential for the survival of a rich and varied ecosystem. I caught up with British-based founder Nat Page. We're now in a typical damp lowland hay meadow, which is probably the most threatened kind of habitat in the whole of Europe today. They existed around villages in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, and really they've only survived in Eastern Europe. Here, 
just in this square meter where we're standing, in the beginning of June, there will be 60 different flower species in every square meter. The diversity of the flowers is just absolutely unbelievable. And that's because this has never been fertilized and has never been sprayed. And this kind of landscape is of fantastic European importance. You say it's under threat, in what way? Uh, there are two reasons. One is the need for farmers to make money. So unless they can get value for the goods they produce under these conditions, they'll be forced to, to intensify. And the other is abandonment, uh, that if this land is left uncultivated, uh, it will degenerate into a low scrub value land. scrub, which doesn't have nearly the diversity. And we're not talking just about flowers here. There are between 100 and 200 species of butterfly that have survived because of the lack of spray. And so we're trying to protect the biodiversity the biodiversity depends on the people and the management by the people, so we're also trying to protect these small-scale farming communities. But the other most important long-term way of promoting survival is helping them get a proper price for the goods they produce, bringing innovative marketing means to support traditional production methods. In many ways it seems that these smallhold farmers are custodians of the landscape because their continued survival ensures the survival of this ecosystem. Yes, let's hope we can keep as much of it as we can. Who knows, in 10 years' time, this will not be the same. Well, it will be here in 10 years' time if everyone comes to look at it and experience it and enjoy it. Yes, look at it, enjoy it and support the local economic system. And it all, the system will continue. Perhaps the best way to explore these gently undulating fringes of Carpathia is by mountain bike. A set of trails has been built through the surrounding woods and hills, linking Viscari to its neighbouring villages. And whilst there's nothing too challenging, it's a great way to see the countryside. I arrived back to the village at dusk, in time to witness one of the most iconic spectacles of rural Transylvanian life. Early each morning, the cattle, individually owned by members of the village, take themselves out to pasture. In the evening, they unerringly manage to find their way back again. For anybody who thinks cows aren't intelligent, have a look at this. They know exactly where they're going, they don't need to be told, they just peel off into their respective homes. As Romania's economy is developing, the environment faces ever greater danger. With much of the country's biggest natural resources either under the ground or sprouting out of it, the impact on this mountain paradise is increasingly costly. This is one of thousands of illegal logging operations that are taking place as I speak in the mountains of forest of this area. Look at this tree, you can count the rings, it's over 100 years old. It's not even selective. Well, it's selective in as much as they take the largest and the oldest trees, cart them off. It's a tragedy. Deforestation is the greatest threat facing this wilderness. As far as the government is concerned and the people who have been restituted land here, Carpathia's main value lies in its prime timber and mineral deposits. For a country struggling to catch up with the rest of Europe, this region is, literally, in some cases, a gold mine. Insufficient resources to police such a huge area and a reluctance to do so makes it almost impossible to prevent such wide-scale clear felling. On top of this, the absence of planning laws is giving rise to a spate of new and often ill-conceived developments, like environmentally damaging ski resorts, hastily built to take advantage of the influx of foreign tourists. If operations like this one are allowed to continue due to greed and corruption and the demands of the Western world, then the forests of Carpathia will probably disappear within the next 10 years. But with Romania still such a poor country, it's hard to argue that they shouldn't be allowed to exploit their natural resources to improve quality of life. I've come to the frontier of the forest near Zarand with friend and environmental activist Radu Mott, to visit one of the last people whose existence remains untouched by the wheels of progress. 
What a glorious place to live, but how isolated. We're here to meet a woman called Vavara, who's been living on top of this mountain all her life. Her husband died 24 years ago. She's got no running water, she's got no electricity, and no one around her for miles. It's a tough life. It's a tough life indeed. How does she survive up here? She has some cows, but nobody will buy the milk anymore. So she gets no income, no income. whatsoever. You have problems with wolves here as well, obviously. The wolves killed a dog last autumn. The wild boars is destroying the crops. And she's got no one else to protect her if, if, if they come, you know. Just the, the dogs. They don't look very fierce, <laughs> I have to be honest. So she purely subsists off the vegetables she grows and from the milk and the livestock. Exactly. And water, what does she do for water? I can't see any springs around here. De unde va aduce apa? There's a spring down in the forest. How does she get it up here? She's carrying plastic bottles full of full of water because she cannot carry the buckets anymore. Well, there are two buckets there. Why don't we go and fill them up for her? Okay, let's do it. Okay, back in a minute. <laughs> I'm not surprised she's scared of coming down to get water in the woods when she's had a dog being killed outside her very door, you know. And the wolves attacking one of her dogs while she was probably in the house. I'm sure she's afraid, but Romania, it's known for this tradition of coexistence between people and large carnivores. And this is a particularly important section of the Carpathians. This corridor connects a separate population of brown bears in Apusain Mountains in Central Carpathian with the main population from Southern Carpathians. Large carnivores can exist in Europe without uh, acceptance of local people. There is motorway planning to be built for the south that will completely block well, they're not going to be able to get across, so... Exactly, without effective mitigation solution... It cuts yes. that migratory route straight in half. Exactly. It will be a total barrier yeah. for wildlife. Well, here's the spring. I see what she means. It's a long way to come, isn't it? Yes, it is. Especially if you need a glass of water in the middle of the night <laughs> and you hear the howling of the wolves outside. I presume that this is scooping out the water. Yeah. I right. can't believe she has to do this every day and she doesn't even use these buckets. These little bottles don't last very long, so it must be constant coming back and forth. Exactly. But it's the only way for her yeah. to, to get what? I think we should try and raise some money, get her a generator and a water pump and a hose sorted out. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay. I hope that'll keep it going for a while. It is remarkable that so much of Romania's natural forest survived communism, a fact that can be partly ascribed to what has ironically become a right-wing pursuit, hunting. One reason the Carpathians are still home to big predators is because Ceausescu forbade hunting by ordinary citizens. According to the European brown bear, total protection in order to have exclusive access to trophies in the late 1970s. Today, Romania is home to over 5,000, around half of Europe's total bear population. One man working tirelessly to ensure their survival is naturalist Christoph Promberger. I joined him on one of his regular trips to monitor bear numbers in the forests north of Brasov. The wilderness really needs a large carnivores because they keep the whole system in balance. They keep the ungulates under, uh, under a certain threshold so the forest can regrow. And when the forest can regrow, all the other species, the birds can live and so on. So the large carnivores are really important to keep everything alive. By ungulates, you mean uh, herbivores, you mean the deer? Red deer, the, the roe deer, roe deer, to some degree wild boar, the chamois in the higher elevations. For example, you know, if you don't have uh, wolves, then the chamois will go down in the forest and then they, in winter, and then they can eat a lot of the young trees. But if the wolves are there, the, the chamois, they stay high up 
and then they don't damage the forest. They protect the trees, they protect the forest from being overgrazed. Exactly, the wolves and the bears and the lynx, they're on top of the food chain. So they control everything which is under them. When they control the ungulates, like the deer, the deer controls something below them and so on, the whole chain uh, keeps going. But if the wolves and the bears and the lynx are gone, then everything gets out of balance. I can't believe how many lorries there are. This is such a common sight on these sort of roads. You just see one every two or three minutes, it seems to me. It's terrible, yes. I mean, they're taking so much more out than they, sh than they should or that they could take out. It's absolutely not sustainable. Why is it so important to preserve these forests? I mean, Romania is a poor country and wood is one of its greatest resources. Well, that's true. We don't need the wilderness, but we don't need St. Paul's Cathedral. We don't need football. We don't need any of these things, but still we want to have them. And we are just one out of hundreds and thousands and millions of species and they all have the same right to exist and they need this wilderness so we cannot just come and say we destroy it all that's just we, should, we can't do that in this area there's about 25 bears that are coming more or less regularly to this height the height is just around there about 150 meters from here Gotta be very quiet now. They're the same family as the American grizzly, aren't they? Yes, they're actually the same species. They're just a different subspecies. Okay. Yeah. We might look out, there might be already tracks. Yeah, they find tracks on the ground. They don't really attack people very well. No, don't worry, don't worry. No, I don't. <laughs> I'm with you, I protect you. This hide was used by trophy hunters who would lay down food and sit in comfort, waiting for bears to wander into their sights. An iron frame was employed to measure the size of prospective targets. Haunches of meat were hoisted and bears tall enough to reach them were deemed fair game. Today bears are still fed and monitored, but to propagate their numbers rather than furnish the homes of the party faithful. Oh yeah, this black one, that's a five-year-old female. She's not coming very often, but I've seen her here before. It's amazing just to see past so It's absolutely amazing. Yeah. What is it? It's not even 30 meters, isn't it? Uh, they probably smell us, so they know that, we're, that there's somebody here. But if we're quiet and if we don't have any, don't do any fast movements, they will tolerate us here. Okay. Is that meat down the far end? It looks like she's sniffing around there. Yes, yes, that is the leftovers from the slaughterhouse. They came word and brought about a week ago a truck full of that stuff here, okay. mainly sheep guts and the sheep heads. Do they prefer that to the muesli? Well, of course, the meat is very protein rich, so they prefer meat, but it starts to get a bit smelly, so I think pretty it's soon. It stings, I can smell a bit of yeah, it. I think pretty soon they won't touch it anymore. The cubs? Yeah, oh yeah, that's a mother with three cubs of the year. They were, they were born in January. Oh, look at that. The first time this year that yes, they come out here. Yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. She was very careful with them so far. So that's the first time that they're here. Wow, so this really is a special occasion. Fantastic. Well, they're up, up big are they're 15 kilos now. Tiny. Yeah. That's so cute. Yeah, they're everyone. <laughs> look at that. See, I was trying to hang on. off. It's trying to hang on. <laughs> I imagine you never get bored of this. No, no, no. I mean, that's it. You come up here almost every day, don't you? You can sit here every evening. There's yeah. every evening something else happening. Yeah. I can watch this forever. Yeah. Really good. Yeah. As well as his environmental work, Christoph and his wife Barbara run an eco lodge, which offers guided excursions to the bear hide as well as kayaking trips. Their riding school, Equus Silvana, lays on equestrian breaks where guests can spend days galloping through fenceless wilderness. <laughs> Miklishwara, in the Hungarian-speaking area of Carpathia, is a small village near Baraolt. I've come here to meet Transylvanian Count Tibor Kalnoki, who is transforming the local community by converting disused homes into traditional guest houses and offering visitors the chance to step back in time. Tibor, hi. Welcome, Charlie. Good to see you. you. This is the most impressive hunting lodge. Yes, it's 500 years old and it's been uh, abandoned for the last 50 or 60 years 
and we're now starting slowly, one step after the other, to restore it. There must be a huge amount involved in, in restoring a place of, of this size. Yes, first a lot of research to see how it has been before, and, uh, and then the techniques, the old techniques have to be used, so it's, it's quite, uh, quite a big job. So you're doing everything in the traditional way? By hand. By hand. How many buildings have you got in the village? In this village there are six houses with barns and all the, you know, all the other buildings around it, and then the manor with, uh, with its domain. So it's, uh, if we take the buildings themselves, it's something like uh, a dozen of the So you're buildings. creating quite a space for people to come and stay and experience the village life here. I know this is just open pasture, but it does feel like we're in some great park. Yes, these, these wonderful uh, trees, which are hundreds of years old, have been giving shade to the cattle, and that's why they're here. They're here. And they're mostly oak, it seems to me. Right? Mostly oak, and some of them are over 500 years old. Tell me the history of your village. I mean, you, your family have been associated with this area for nearly a thousand years, haven't they? Well, the village itself is the oldest of the whole region, of the Sekla land, as we call our region, which is populated by the Seklas. Um, and it's going to have its 800th anniversary this year. The family is, uh, is slightly younger. They came only 40 years later, so it's something like 760 years now. A relative newcomer. Yes, 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 absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and you were living in exile for quite some time during Ceausescu's reign. Yes. You then got the go-ahead to come back. Exactly. So I, was, I, I, was, I was raised mainly in France because my grandfather had already to leave um, just before the Second World War, actually, as an anti-fascist. Poor man, he was anti-fascist and anti-communist and was born in 1900, so he had a difficult life. He was ahead of his time. Yes. I came back in the 90s and uh, started to sue the state uh, for illegal uh, expropriation, and I, I won some of the cases, but we don't have enough land to make a living from. So we decided um, uh, to live from, from tourism because it's, uh, it's the ideal way also to support the villages themselves. For example, in our guest houses we employ more people than we have beds and it's very um, popular within the, the village because the way we employ people allows them to keep their farms. If they would go to the city, they would have to give up their farms and, and work their way full of living. Time. Exactly. So this is just the right way for them to earn an extra living, but to, to keep their own uh, lifestyle. And not compromise that. Exactly. Do you think that this, this wonderful way of life, do you think it's, it's doomed? Is it inevitable that it will die out? Uh, I hope not. You know, um, I've seen in America and also already in England also reenactments of, uh, you know, in, in, in open air museums, um, people get dressed and then reenact uh, ways of life they think it might have been a uh, hundred years earlier. Well, here this is not necessary yet because we're still, it's still happening. But it, it is so important to keep it going because once we lose it, um, it'll be lost. Gone forever. Gone forever. The next morning, Tibor and I took a trip to the even more remote village of Zalampatag, where he's been working closely with His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales to restore several properties as examples of how rural tourism can benefit local communities without impacting on the environment. One thing about Romania that I always find surprising is you drive down these roads in the middle of nowhere and you come to these little pockets of civilization. And, and then you have you something are. like this. And you have yes. something like this yes. at the end of it. Have a look at the main house. We have uh, three rooms here. It's been quite some painstaking work uh, restoring all this furniture. And your carpenters did the veneers and did all this? Yes, well. yes, and the polishing and the upholstery and everything. And Fair. even these electrical fittings have been, had to be restored. And the paintings? Paintings. Uh, most of the paintings have been uh, hand-picked by HRH. I love this. This is a carpet, presumably. Yes, original. these are Turkish and Caucasian antique carpets. Once they, they are too old to be kept on the floor, we put them on the, on the walls. Well, it lends a warmth to the room, Absolutely. which I, I, I imagine you need in the middle of winter, because it gets quite Definitely. cold here, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly, you've got it right, <laughs> yes. I've seen this colour on certain buildings in parts of Spain. Is this a traditional uh, lime wash here? Yes, here it's called Transylvanian Blue. And uh, it's a uh, characteristic here for serfs' houses, for stables, for houses that are not dwelling houses. So this is the old stable building, which we converted a bit to, uh, to a more comfortable place. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> well, it's a fabulous place to come and hide away. 
What's the inscription there? I got the whales bit. <laughs> yes, it's a tradition to, uh, to document the dates of uh, building and renovation in houses in the main beams. So this one reads, uh, this house has been renovated by Count Thibaut Karnoki in 2009 for the Prince of Wales. Uh -huh. It's so satisfying watching craftsmen at work. It's immaculate when they put the tiles in. <laughs> yes, I wonder how they get it right. It's, it's not so obvious, actually. No, it is like doing a jigsaw puzzle, right? Yeah, now. I think. Tell me, Tibor, why did the Prince of Wales fall in love with this particular place? I mean, I can see it's very beautiful, but why here? I, I suppose it is because it's a place where the local population still lives in total harmony with the environment, with nature. And it, it is not complete and total wilderness like up in the mountains. It is actually handmade, but it is the perfect cohabitation of man with nature. It's easy to forget in such comfortable surroundings that the forest is still only a few feet away from the back door. A fact I was reminded of when I took a quick stroll in the adjacent hills. Walking up through fields of orchids along the edge of the tree line, you are completely immersed in the natural world. I never dreamt that I would actually see bears in the wild outside a bear hide. But here was a sight I'd been hoping for all along. Proof that man has yet to ruin this pristine and innocent landscape. This is incredible. I can't believe my luck. Look. This is why the Carpathian forests, mountains and villages need to be preserved in all their untamed glory. Not just for the benefit of future generations, but to ensure the survival of Europe's most endangered carnivores. If something isn't done, then this verdant paradise will become as ecologically barren as the highlands of Scotland. Once covered by magnificent forests of oak, beech and pine, now bare with new saplings grazed into submission by a wildly inflated deer population. But it's here I've come, on the last leg of my journey, to meet one of Carpathia's greatest crusaders, His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. The key thing I, I think about Romania, Transylvania in, in, in particular, is, is that there's so much we can learn from, it seems to me. It is the last corner of Europe where you see true sustainability and uh, complete resilience and the, and the maintenance of, of, of entire ecosystems to the, for the benefit of mankind but, and also for nature. And we, there's so much we, we must learn from that before it's too late, I think. So presumably this is why it's so important to preserve it for the future? Well, I think so, but you know, people will say, oh, well, you know, she's just trying mm. to preserve things in Aspic, or you're trying to prevent progress and yeah. so on. But you'd think by now we might have learned a few lessons mm. from the things that have gone wrong with uh, an agri-industrial approach to everything. Because the, the great thing, it seems to me, about Transylvania is the combination of natural ecosystems the forests and the agricultural areas, together with the, the human uh, cultural systems. And it's this extraordinarily unique, uh, integrated relationship, which is of such huge importance. Once you pull it all apart, you're left with something which can just be exploited without being treated in a sustainable way, if you see what I mean. Because if you cut down great swathes of the Carpathian natural forest, you're actually destroying one of nature's great services to the rest of mankind in terms of carbon sequestration. Given the fact that the rise of industry and agriculture has led to the almost total destruction of the great forest of Caledon here in Scotland, do you think that there's a way of stopping the same thing from happening in Romania? Well, we well, should be clever enough, wouldn't you think, by now, and wise enough to We'd know hope. That <laughs> some possible lessons to be learned in, in avoiding that from happening. But otherwise, mm. if we just go on the same way, you end up with destruction occurring, mm. and then people later on are saying, hang on a minute, you've got to try and put this back. What is the point of running into a proverbial brick wall, this time of such a painful thought, that by the time we realise that we have to redesign our food systems, and put nature back at the heart of the whole process in order to provide us with what we, we take for granted. How, do we, how are we going to be able to put it back? Yeah. So I think Transylvania is an absolutely key issue that has to be addressed. 
What do you love the most about Romania? It's the timelessness of it, which is so remarkable. Mm. And almost out of some of those stories one used to read as a child, it's, it's quite remarkable. People are yearning for that sense of belonging and identity and meaning. And we have to find, we have to rediscover some of these aspects of the way we produce food and live with and maintain and give back to nature if we are to make sure this whole you know, system continues. And that's why human cultural systems matter, because they're intimately linked to that aspect of nature. It's in us, but we've somehow denied it and thrown it away and said it doesn't matter, it doesn't exist, it's irrelevant. It isn't irrelevant. Nourishes the soul and the heart, absolutely. <laughs> that's what Romania does for yes. you. <laughs>